thing about that is that, uh, you know, I come from a show business background. My dad, Robert Winkler, Robert Bobby Winkler, was a well-known child actor, teenage actor, kid star in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, my dad worked in over 80 movies and over 200 radio shows with almost all the stars of the golden age of Hollywood. It was, his career was remarkable. Um, he was born in Chicago, and his uh, grandmother got him into, or his aunt got him into uh, doing amateur contests and teaching him how to sing, and he wound up performing in all the vaudeville clubs and all the dance-a-thons and walk-a-thons and all the things, and he won a lot of prizes uh, for doing it, and he uh, got into show business in Chicago, and he did all the radio shows, playing kid parts and everything, and then sang at the Democratic Convention for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He sang the national anthem, and Charlie Chaplin's wife, Mildred Harris Chaplin, saw my dad and thought he was a very talented kid, and wrote a letter of introduction to Hal Roach Studios in Hollywood, and my dad and his mother and father said, we'll go to Hollywood and Bobby will have a big career. And so it happened. Uh, he went to Hal Roach Studios. He worked in the R Gang comedies with Spanky and Alfalfa and Buckwheat. And you can look up the titles. He'd like Pigskin Palooka, General Spanky, Football Romeo, Pays You Exit, Hearts or Thumps, all R Gang Follies. Uh, he did a ton of that stuff. He did a lot of work with Patsy Kelly and other stars at Roach and uh, Eddie Cantor and whatnot, and uh, went to the Hollywood Professional School. And there were tons of celebrity friends of his there that he worked with, and Donald O'Connor and whatnot. But uh, Dad did, a, did so much work with almost all the stars at that time and worked in Sullivan's Travels, with Joel McRae, that was a Preston Sturgis movie, considered one of the top 100 movies of all time. He worked, uh, he played Pat O'Brien as a boy in The Iron Major, which is a big film. Uh, it was funny, my dad was also in, he did so much radio. He was a regular, he played the newsboy on Big Town with Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson was a big, famous uh, gangster movie actor and such. Uh, and they'd have two shows, one for the East Coast and one for the West Coast. And during lunch, Mr. Robinson would have dinner or with my father and my grandfather. And my dad was going to audition to play Pat O'Brien as a boy, and he had the script with him. And Edward G. Robinson said, what do you got, what do you got there, Bobby? You know, and he says, oh, I'm, I'm auditioning to play Pat O'Brien as a boy. And he said, let me see those sides. Let me see the script. He said, okay, Bobby, this is what you're going to do, see? This is how you're going to play the part, see? And he goes through the whole thing. And so anyway, Dad did what Edward G. Robinson told him to do, and he booked the part, and he got the role playing Pat O'Brien as a boy in The Iron Major. So when you see that movie, it's actually Bobby Winkler playing Edward G. Robinson doing Pat O'Brien as a boy. <laughs> anyway, Dad also did a ton of westerns, and he loved working at Iverson's Ranch and doing all... He worked with all the major cowboy stars. It was amazing. Almost every major cowboy movie star at that time, Dad worked in, or worked with them in their films. Uh, Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, Wild Bill Elliott, Bob Steele, Johnny Mac Brown, Tim McCoy, Bob Baker... Uh, Bob Livingston, George Houston, George Montgomery, all the stars, and, and the comedic uh, sidekicks, Smiley Burnett and Ruth Davis, and I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. Dad loved working on westerns. I remember him telling me in one of his westerns, uh, Bad Men of Missouri, which was in at Universal, they had a, it was about the uh, Dalton brother or Younger Brothers, I think, the famous gang, and they had a Dalton gang member who was a senior citizen who'd been let out of jail after his crimes, and he was a, he was actually a, uh, a supervisor or a technical consultant for this movie. My dad was like, "Wow, there's this real gangster from the not gangster outlaw cowboy outlaw from that era." You have to remember in the '30s and '40s, people who'd lived in the real West. Some of them were senior citizens at the time that all those cowboy movies were being made. So 
Dad, uh, Dad had a fantastic career, and uh, you know he he did cartoon voices for Walt Disney and Bambi, and uh, you know Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies. There was a time in the '30s and '40s where you could go to a movie house, and Bobby Winkler was uh, the voice in the cartoon in the Looney Tune cartoon, and then you'd see a, a specialty like Pete Smith specialty or some little newsreel or whatever. And Dad would be in the Pete Smith Smith specialty. And then you'd have a serial. Dad was in one of the most famous serials of all time, considered the one of the best, a top of two or three, Daredevils of the Red Circle. And he was the star, the child star of it, and the catalyst of the whole story. William Whitney directed it. So you'd see Dad in the serial, and then you'd see him in the Western, you know, if it was an Autry movie or Wild Bill Elliott or... Johnny Mac Brown or whatever, and then he'd be in the A picture, like, you know, Waterloo Bridge or one of these other A movies, and then when you got home, you turn on the radio, there he was on radio, on Lux Radio Theater with Cecil B. DeMille or, you know, uh, uh, Edward G. Robinson's Big Town or whatever, or Bob Hope or Jack Benny or, uh, you know, he he played W.C. Field's son on radio, uh, you know, I, I could go on and on and on. Well, what happened was he, he had this fantastic career, and he caught the tail end of World War II, and he volunteered to go into the Army Air Corps. And he had action in the Philippines, and they machine-gunned at him, and the jeep overturned on I mean, there's a whole story there. And, um, and then when he came back, the business was kind of in a mess because the government said that the movie studios could no longer own the movie theaters. That the, the studios had owned the theaters, and it was kind of a violation of state and federal antitrust laws, and so they had this law that said you had to break up. You either had to be a producer of films or you had to be an exhibitor. And so there were all these things. His lifetime agent had retired, Marty Sperber, and his parents said, you have to go to college. And so dad went to college, he became interested in law. I will say this, Dad worked as an adult in Criss Cross with Burt Lancaster and uh, Yvonne DiCarlo while he was going to law school. He became interested in law. And also he did a film with Johnny Mac Brown playing the younger leading man. Dad was supposed to do another 12 pictures with Johnny Mac Brown. The formula was gonna be Johnny Mac Brown as the older, kind of Hopalong Cassidy cowboy lead father figure and Ray Hatton was going to be the comedy relief and then my dad Bob Winkler was going to be Robert Winkler was going to be the young leading man who'd have the romances with the leading ladies dad did the first picture but he did not do the other 11 films so uh, he became interested in the law had had a very successful entertainment attorney, uh, entertainment law firm, representing uh, writers, producers, directors, actors that he'd worked with as a kid. So it was the most amazing thing, uh, you know, that, for example, George Montgomery, he was in a movie called Last of the Duanes, and then later in life he represented George Montgomery as a client. George was a very nice man, wonderful guy. After Dad uh, became an attorney, a dad had an uh, incredibly successful law firm, and he represented writers, producers, directors, people he worked with, actors he worked with. He had like three law offices. He had like tons of armies of secretaries. Busy, 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 incredibly, incredibly successful. But he had, you know, all these clients, like I said, George Montgomery and Al Molinero, and, and he did work for Adam West and lots of other people and writers and Earl Felton, who wrote the screenplay for 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for Walt Disney. And uh, he would still have fans come into his law offices for autographs and stuff. They'd track him down, Western movie fans, and come out. I remember Dad represented an Indian tribe, and there was an Indian chief who would come in to see him and in full headdress and Indian outfit. I mean, it was like something, like he walked off of a movie set. It was amazing. And uh, I remember a funny thing about Al Molinero, who had been on Happy Days, because it was before he had Happy Days, or he was an actor, and he, says, he said to Dad, Bob, I'm going to be a model. <laughs> and Dad said, Al...
<laughs> if you looked in the mirror, I mean, you're, you're a character actor. You're a model, a male model. And sure enough, Al became a model. He was on all these billboards called Kiss. It was like Kiss the Cook or whatever. And I think Happy Days came out of that ad. Dad won a lot. I mean, most of his cases, he would always win the cases. And Melvin Belli and F. Lee Bailey hated my dad. <laughs> they were of that whole era because my dad would always win the cases. You know, funny thing, dad handled a little bit of uh, criminal law as well, but he, he had to give it up. He couldn't take it. One time he got this guy, he was a compulsive purse thief. This man would steal women's purses all the time, and Dad was, I don't know, the evidence was kind of funny, and Dad wound up getting him off, but he was going to go to jail for many years for stealing women's purses. So he's in my dad's office. He says, Bob, thank you so much for helping me, and blah, 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 and everything else. Thank you very much. And he, as he, he left the office, about two minutes later, the secretary came and said, Bob, what, what's the matter? That guy just stole my purse. <laughs> He represented custom car builder George Barris, who built the Batmobile and the Munster's Coach and the Dragula and the Monkey Mobile and all those famous custom cars and hot rods of the 50s and 60s for the celebrities and everything. So Dad represented and was good friends with George. And even back in the 50s, they'd be playing cards when Dad was single and they'd chase girls on the beach and they'd play cards with Keenan Wynn and all these other celebrity uh, people. Um... You know, the other thing, too, was that dad's dad had sensational cases, uh, criminal cases and other cases that were always in the newspapers of the L.A. Times and Daily News and all that here. And uh, some of his cases established laws in California uh, at the time. Um, there was uh, one woman who there was one famous murder case where. The woman, uh, the husband murdered the wife, and she was a communist, and she was doing all these radical things and, you know, committing crimes, and the husband in some crime killed her. Dad won the case, and the guy got off, and the lawyer who was representing the woman who was accused of being a communist, radical, whatever, um, Dad pulled a very famous, that uh, was in the LA Times, a very unusual stunt. He called the attorney to the stand and went for the, for the communist lady and said, are you now an, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? <laughs> and he took the fifth. And that was the end of the case. That's how it <laughs> And in the 1950s, Dad also wrote a law book for kids called Laws for Youth. And it was sort of like a guide for parents and kids about the laws of California and how you're supposed to, you know, not get into trouble if you do these things and blah, blah, blah. And it's so funny to read it today, you know, because I think we need that book again today. <laughs> Dad had a successful acting career, and then he had a successful military career, then he had a successful law career. It's an amazing thing. And later in life, he was a member of the Republican Party, and... Believe it or not, the Republican Party had asked him in 1980 to run for Congress because they needed somebody to be a congressman in this district. Um, and there'd been a man named Anthony Bielinson who had been the district uh, congressman. He was the Democrat, and he was always, you know, he was always winning, and they needed to have somebody to try to run against him. So Dad really didn't want to be a politician. He said, oh, boy. But they twisted his arm, and he said, okay, I agree, I'll do it. So he ran for Congress. And it just so happened in 1980 that Ronald Reagan lived in the district that my dad was running for Congress. And now dad had worked with Ronald Reagan in the life of Newt Rockne, All-American. He had been in that movie as a kid actor. So anyway, when they went back to Washington, D.C., dad met with Reagan. And dad knew Reagan from parties that would happen in Bel Air. And my parents would go to the parties that Reagan would have. And whatnot. But anyway, so he went back to Washington, D.C., and Ronald Reagan was there and uh, was very enjoying talking to my father. And he said, you know, Bob, I voted for you. <laughs> and my dad said, well, I voted for you too, Dutch, you know. And they, that was his name, Dutch Reagan. And, those. and uh, 
then he was saying, well, Bobby worked in Loot Rockney, whatever, you know, and George Bush, oh, is that right? Is that right? You know, it was very funny. Um, I remember meeting Reagan when I was a little boy and uh, shaking his hand and everything else. Well, sadly, sadly, he came danger. He won the primary and he came very dangerously close to winning. And uh, he thought, oh, God, am I going to have to really do this? You know, and it was like uh, he came very close and he didn't spend any money or anything. I mean, he wasn't going to. I mean, he did it just to kind of put a name on a ballot. It, he didn't want to, you know. But uh, sadly, he, he did. He got stomach cancer in 1989, and he passed away very quickly, and it was it was awful. But because um, he could have, I mean, his mother lived into her 80s. There's no reason why he couldn't have continued, you know, another 20, 30 years. But, um, you know, so I'm glad he didn't win because he spent the time with us, you know. My, my sister and I, and my mother. Besides my dad, my mom, Betty Winkler, whose maiden name was Betty Sturm, she was also in the business shortly, I mean, for a short period of time. Uh, she's German, she came from Germany, and she moved into the Hollywood Studio Club, which was the place that all the good girl actresses in Hollywood at the time went to. They were chaperoned, and it was a secure building, and, you know, the ladies who ran it. Mary Pickford ran, uh, started the Hollywood Studio Club, and my mom was there, and she did some acting. Her her roommates uh, at the same place were like Joanne Worley from Laugh-In and Pat Priest from The Munsters, and uh, mom did a couple of movies. She did a sort of a uh, an Arabian Nights film where she played a harem girl. And then she, Mom, appeared in this very, very famous cult movie that Timothy Carey made called The World's Greatest Sinner. The World's Greatest Sinner was about this guy who became a superstar, like an Elvis Presley-type guy, and it went to his head, and he thought he was God, and he became kind of a Hitler type of character. And he had followers, and my mother was one of the followers, and she was kind of like the Ava Brown to Adolf Hitler, you know? Crazy. And uh, guys like Quentin Tarantino and all of them, they know the world's greatest sinner. This movie plays and plays, and it's like an underground cult movie, famous film. And uh, Martin Scorsese knows it. And so, anyway, Mom played this part, but Timothy Carey took about a year to make this movie, and... About six months into it, my mom said, enough already, uh, and she met my father, and they were going to get married. And so mom uh, didn't finish the picture. And later, Timothy Carey wrote a letter to her, and my dad got it, and he said, Betty, do you want to, Timothy Carey wants you to come back and do that movie. Do you want to? She says, no, I'm married. I'm going to have children. I have a family. I don't want to be part of it anymore. So Timothy Carey wound up, because my dad would have been cool with it, and so my so Timothy Carey hired a woman to do little saxophone playing or whatever that looked kind of like my mom, but it wasn't her. That My mom's part was much, much bigger in the final cut. But anyway, mom's in it, and it's a crazy movie. But prior to meeting my dad and prior to The World's Greatest Sinner, one funny quick story, uh, mom went on a double date with Elvis Presley, and they went to go see Psycho at a movie, a, a drive-in movie theater. And it was so funny because as soon as the famous shower scene started where the killer went in and he got the ee, 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 ee. Elvis couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand the sight of the blood and he left the drive-in theater and took everybody with him because he couldn't stand that. So that was pretty funny. My, uh, my mother really didn't want to pursue acting other than those two pictures that she did. And uh, Timothy Carey's son later called her and said, will you be part of this documentary? And I think I think maybe Tarantino was part of the documentary or Martin Scorsese or Jack Nicholson might have been part of it. I don't know. I, a lot of people were part of it. They wanted her to be part of it. And she did. She participated in it. She liked Timothy Carey. She liked... Timothy Carey was married to a German lady. So they got along on the set and they were out in Pasadena or something. And uh, the son, Romeo Carey, was very nice. But uh, anyway, uh, so mom's part of this picture. When I show it to her, she gets very embarrassed. In the 1960s and early to mid-70s, my mother was in the wig business. 
and she used to sell wigs to Disneyland. Uh, the girls who were Snow White and Cinderella and, and, and Alice in Wonderland would wear my mother's hair pieces. And sometimes the Pirates of the Caribbean pirates, too, would wear her hair pieces. So when we were little kids, my mother would say, come on, kids, I got to go to Disneyland. We, I have wigs I have to deliver. And so my sister Patricia and I, we were like six and five and six or six and seven, whatever, we would uh, go to Disneyland. And after my mother would do her big business backstage, we would be given free tickets to go into the park and we'd go around to, you know, fantasy land or whatever. And we'd spend maybe a few hours and we'd leave. Well, this happened over and over and over and over again to the point where we didn't want to go to Disneyland anymore. We were probably the only two children in the entire world that when my mom said, when, when the parents says, hey kids, come on, we got to go to Disneyland. We cried, no, we don't want to go to Disneyland. All right, so so how I got into the business, I mean, I, so I came from this background with my father, I mean, going back to classic, the days of classic Hollywood of the 1930s and 40s. Um, now, one thing I will say, though, that Hollywood of my father, uh, of course, no longer exists. That Hollywood was a totally different world. Dad used to tell me, Hollywood Boulevard in the 30s and 40s. It was clean and there was no litter and no graffiti and people would get all dressed up and walk the boulevard. And it was, uh, it was glamorous. You'd see stars walking up and down Hollywood Boulevard. My grandfather had a bookstore called Winkler and Son Books. It was like the Barnes and Noble of the day in the 30s. And, and, uh, Dad uh, just told me it was an amazing thing. Dad, you know, was in the Hollywood Christmas Parade as a celebrity. Actually, funny story, he was in the car with Boris Karloff, who played Frankenstein, and Dad was sitting in the back, and he was all excited during the parade and was kicking by accident uh, Boris Karloff in the back of the head. And, and Karloff turns to my father and says, Listen, Bobby, not too many children get to kick Frankenstein and get away with it. <laughs> and my dad said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Karloff, I won't kick you again. But anyway, that Hollywood was totally a, a totally different, glamorous, clean, uh, wonderful place. Okay? Um, I got into the business in the, in the early 1980s. And uh, I had loved sci-fi, fantasy, and adventure television shows, movies as a kid. I especially liked Japanese stuff. I loved the Godzilla movies. I used to watch Ultraman as a kid, the English dub series. Um, I'd come home from school, do my homework, have milk and cookies, and when I was done with all that, I would turn on the TV, and from like 4.30 to 5, it would be Ultraman. And it was like watching a miniature Godzilla movie every day, Monday through Friday. And all the friends at school, all, my, all the guys loved Ultraman, and we'd get into fights on the playground, you know, as if we were the heroes fighting the monsters or whatnot. And, of course, Speed Racer was great, too. I love that. And it stuck with me for some reason. I always thought that the Japanese stuff of that era was very artistic. It, it, I, I appreciated the art. I appreciated the quality of it. And there were certain elements, it's hard to put into words or explain, was very different from anything else that was on TV. And so I became very interested in that. Um, I, I, I went to college. I, I studied acting and directing at UCLA with a man named Don Richardson. Now, he was fantastic. Don Richardson directed... I don't know, 800 primetime television shows in the 50s and 60s. He had come from New York. He directed, you know, plays in New York. He came from that whole New York Academy of Dramatic Arts, and he knew Stella Adler and Lilia Kazan and, and Lee Strasberg and all those people. He thought that they were full of shit, <laughs> you know. Uh, he taught an alternative to method acting. He was very adamant. You don't have to be a... You don't have to do drugs to play a drug dealer or a drug user. You don't have to turn tricks to play a prostitute. It's the work of the imagination. He also thought that they got the Russian thing all wrong, you know. But anyway, Don Richardson was wonderful. He taught an alternative to method acting, and he taught directing, and he was 
absolutely fantastic. He taught acting to Anne Bancroft, Grace Kelly, Zero Mostel, John Cassavetes, Elizabeth Montgomery, and I learned so much from Don Richardson. And I use it today as a director, you know, actors asking questions. Who am I? What do I want? How do I feel? Acting's 80% emotion. If the behavior's correct, even a deaf audience will understand it. Uh, the Emotion's everything. Uh, I, I could go on and on about that, but the bottom line is I use Don Richardson's principles every time I direct something, you know. And it's funny, you know, going back to the Ultraman influence, that I later became the producer, writer, director of the American English versions of all the new movies. Well, I wanted to wear all the hats. I wanted to be able to write, I wanted to be able to produce, I wanted to be able to direct. And so uh, I got an agent, I got into Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA and such, and um, I began doing what are considered like silent bit parts or five and under parts in lots of stuff in the 80s. Uh, for example, I would do, in an episode of Remington Steel with Pierce Brosnan and Doris Roberts, um, I would play a car thief. And so on the set it was Pierce Brosnan, Doris Roberts, me, and a couple guys playing the heavies, the villains. and. There was a scene where Doris Roberts was investigating some villains. She went out on a ledge of a building to hide from them. And while she was looking down to the sidewalk in her parked car, which was this gorgeous thing, I stole her car. You know, and I'm waving to her, hi, you know. And I would do things like that. Um, Murder, She Wrote. I'd play like a bellhop in Murder, She Wrote. Or, or The Fall Guy. I did some second unit stuff on that. I was the stand-in for Jason Bateman on a sitcom called It's Your Move, which was like one of his first things. And I played his part. So while he was in school, I actually performed the part during the rehearsals and for the NBC people uh, and, and on the set. And then they'd have, they'd throw little five and unders or, you know, silent bits or whatever. So I did that. And uh, I remember Garrett Morris from Saturday Night Live was one of the actors on it. He says, hey, man, you better than... You better than the star of this thing. Why aren't you starting? And I said, "Shut up, or I'll lose my job." <laughs> you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, I did. I was in Back to the Future, and again, it was one of those little, kind of silent bit things. Obviously, it got cut out. But I remember being on that set, and the the I was one of the 1950s kids in Back to the Future, and I remember that courthouse square set was amazing because all the storefronts had 1950s uh, products, candy bars, whatever, and it was, the detail, the attention to detail was just incredible. It was really like you were back in the 50s. And I'll never forget, I went into the hair department, I went to makeup, I had all this grease on my hair, I, I mean, I looked like a kid in the 50s. I always looked much younger than my age. And I remember this big Universal Studios tour bus had to was avoiding Courthouse Square, but was near the makeup trailers. When I got out, the tour guide said, oh, and this is the set for our new upcoming film, Back to the Future, and there's one of our stars. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God. And 10 million Japanese tourists <laughs> got up and took my picture. And I just, you know, raced out of there. But I'd like to get one of those pictures. I think that would be kind of interesting. I, I did a, I played a drunk kid in Pretty in Pink. Anyway, I did a whole bunch of that stuff. And then I did, you know, I had an IBM computer commercial that went for many years, and I was the star of that. It was on all the CBS shows. Remember, at that time, there was only like three major networks, okay? So when I was in a commercial, you could theoretically get 80 million people watching that commercial, okay? It, there was no internet, there was no phone stuff, there was no, 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 not a lot of cable. So when you were a star on a commercial or something, it was a big thing. When I did these little bit things in the sitcoms, it was a bit, I'd be recognized. You know, it was crazy. I would go to the bank, hey, were you the guy on, on Family Ties? Where? Oh, anyway. I, I, you know, if you look up the IMDb, you'll see all that stuff. I mean, I, I, there's, I did a ton of it, okay? But it was a learning experience, too, because I learned the tremendous waste of Hollywood that, you know, uh, 
anyway, I, I learned that after, it doesn't really make sense to do 25 or 30 takes of any one scene. I don't think it usually gets better. It just wears the actor out, you know. But anyway, so I had a connection with Tatsunoko Production Company, and I began to start to produce my first anime series, which was Tekaman the Space Knight. And that was, um, uh, it was about a space pilot who battled evil alien robots, and he'd wear this indestructible armor. And um, anyway, Tatsunoko wanted to work with me, and uh, I wrote, produced, and directed the American English language version of that show. And we were working with 16 millimeter film prints, and I was actually splicing film. And, and uh, we dubbed it at Bob Clampett's recording studio. And Bob Clampett was a famous artist from Warner Brothers. He, I think he created Tweety Bird and Sylvester and all that. But anyway, his famous characters were Beanie and Cecil. And so we recorded the, the episodes of Tekaman in the Beanie and Cecil recording studio that I think they had in the 60s. And it was right there on Seward in, in Hollywood. And uh, I asked my father if he'd do a voice to play the professor, Dr. Edward Richardson. So after a sabbatical, Dad came back and did the voice. He stepped right into it. It was just like back in the 30s. And he did a great job. And I'm so glad I got to work with him on that. And then we had many other great actors and character people and Clancy Serko and Kathy Pruitt. Oh, they're all gone now. A lot of them are gone now. Bill Hederly Jr. played Tekaman, and he was very much of a method actor. So when he was in the dubbing booth and Tekaman was battling the evil alien robots, he would be jumping up and down in the booth. Space Lance! Spur cutters! Take that! You know, um, he was, it was terrific, you know. I mean, he fulfilled that part. He was over-the-top acting, which is what it required. But um, I, you have to understand something. I was the youngest producer of a television show, especially an anime show, at that time. I was 19 years old, and I had a syndicated television series going. And I was before most of the companies that do anime today... They came much later. I was, I predate them, okay? And I'm still working today. Um, when we had it syndicated in Chicago, Minneapolis, Atlanta, whatever, it, you know, we had over 10 million kids watching Tech Man. And, uh, you know, at that time, uh, to, as of the date of this recording, we're doing this interview today, I mean, major networks will get maybe 2 million, 5 million viewers, uh, Tech Man got more than tonight's primetime major network television, as far as audience, okay? And, you know, I was a, I was a small company at the time. Uh, they were just, you know, a, a show like The Transformers or, or, or GoBots had an even I infinitely bigger audience than what Tech Man was. So just to let you know what the audiences were like back then. But there were very strict rules for children's television at that time. And there were network standards and practices. There was a lady named Pe uh, Peggy Sharon, and she had, a comp she had a group or an organization called Action for Children's Television. And, oh, she was going after all these shows that were basically half-hour ads for toys, you know. Now, we didn't have a toy line for Tekka Man at, at that time. And um, so we were okay. We were off her radar. But there were a lot of things you had to do. With Tekka Man, we had to kind of cut a little bit of the violence out because the show was too violent in some ways. Um, I tried to do as little of it as possible and the alien creatures that were destroyed by Tekaman, or killed by Tekaman, we referred to them as androids or robots. So we would never kill an alien, evil alien creature. We would deactivate a robot. <laughs> And that was it. Or if you saw this giant ship explode, we'd have to put a line in there like, well, oh, by some miracle, luckily nobody was seriously hurt. You know, that type of thing. But that's what you had to do. These were kids' shows aired for children. I, I've got the TV guides to this day. You know, every Friday, Tech A Man would be running in the San Francisco area from 8.30 to 9 or 8 to 8.30. I can't remember. But... um. Of course, that all changed later, 
But, um, oh, and Tekka Man also sold on VHS tape at the time. And, you know, honestly, it was like 80,000 80, units. It was on par with what Disney would do when Disney would release Cinderella or Snow White on VHS. They would do 80 to 100 million units or more. And Tekka Man had almost that many for some of the episodes that were released by Congress Video Group, which was part of the American Playing Card Company. So it got a lot of exposure and such. Um, we used to go to the NATP conventions and when we had a syndicated television market in this country, and we sold it uh, in, in syndication. So with Tekka Man the Space Knight, um, you know, we made a, a series that was successfully, you know, was out there. And I began to get, well, other studios came to me with other stuff. And I remember Fist of the North Star, uh, I was presented with some of those shows and said, Mr. Winkler, would you like to produce that? And I took one look at it, and it was so violent and so sadistic. I said, oh, you know, I had to do all these things in order to get Tekka Man on the air. How the hell am I going to get Fist of the North Star on the air? There was no way that I could... I mean, it was just really over the top. So at the, you have to understand, at that time, that's what it was for, for, tele, for kids' television. So I passed on it. Interestingly enough, years later, the studio came back to me, and then I, I did it. I made six movies of that exact property that I turned down. You know, another interesting story was with, with Ultraman. We were going to do something... Uh, Adam West had, my dad had done legal work for Adam West, the television Batman. And uh, I had an idea to take an Ultraman television series, and it was a show called Ultraman 80, and to have Adam as sort of the American star. And in the show, there was this spaceship that would orbit Earth. And so we would rebuild that set have Adam the captain of the ship, as aliens would come to Earth or things would happen on Earth or monsters would attack, Adam would report back down to headquarters to Earth saying there's an alien or there's a this or there's a monster attacking, go do it, and he'd keep an eye on it. He was sort of like what Raymond Burr was in Godzilla, how they inserted Raymond Burr into the original Japanese Godzilla movie. So Adam wanted to do it, and we were really communicating with Subaraya to do that. And to make a long story short, it didn't happen. But it was before the Power Rangers, okay? It was sort of a similar type of a concept. And uh, years later at NBC, I saw Adam West, and he says, Billy, because the Power Rangers had already come out, it was a big hit. He said, Billy, they stole your Power Rangers idea. <laughs> it wasn't Power Rangers. Interestingly enough, here's another funny thing. Saban w went, wanted to do... Ultraman, originally. It wasn't about Super Sentai or Power Ranger type characters. It was only when Tsuburaya said no that he wound up doing the second choice, which was to take the other Japanese property and turn it into what ultimately became Power Rangers. Strange. Isn't it funny how that works? It's a funny bit of trivia. When they were casting the very first original Power Rangers, the ones that went, the show that ultimately went on the air, they called me and aggressively were pursuing me. They wanted me to audition to play one of those lead rangers. And, I mean, seriously, the, they called me and they, were, they wanted me to come in. I said no, I wouldn't do it because it was a non-union show. It was non-union and I was, I was a member of SAG and AFTRA. And so I didn't do it. But I... I had a very good opportunity. I had a, I think I had a very good chance that I might have been one of those original Rangers had I said yes. But that's okay because fate turned out that I got to do all these voices in anime and I got to be the voice of Ultraman X as well as Ultraman Taro in one of the other films which was a different different voice. There were other projects that I worked on. Uh, I was pitching a lot of kids' shows at the time to NBC and ABC. We came very close with certain projects. Paul Zastupnevich uh, was the Irwin Allen's uh, 
designer and and he'd come up with these big presentations and we ha he made presentations for pilots that I'd originate that I'd come up with and we would be pitching them to networks and he'd say to me my god it's like you're like Irwin Allen re reincarnated <laughs> you know when we'd pitch and I had toy companies we were working with toy companies to develop a property called Johnny Lightning based on toy cars famous die cast metal toy cars they were sort of like hot wheel cars and uh we were developing a series, had a series optioned. Uh, I then later developed a comic book toy line with a company, and then there were some issues with that, which I won't go into now. But anyway, um, so I was developing things as well as doing original productions, and uh, I then wound up doing more anime. But before I did that, uh, I wound up working with a company called Galaxy Online, which was like the sci-fi channel and the discovery channel on the internet. And David Gerald from Star Trek was part of it. Dorothy Fontana was part of it. Uh, Harlan Ellison had commentaries uh, for the company that he'd shot. Um, ben Bova was part of it. And anyway, you had Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols. And it was very exciting. I was developing projects and handling all the celebrities and uh, putting together all these things. And then when the dot-com bubble burst, Galaxy burst as well. But at that time, I discovered uh, digital video and how you could make films that would look like 35 millimeter film. So I actually began producing my original films in addition to later doing more anime work. One of the first films I did when I left Galaxy Online I had this crazy idea called the Double D Avenger. And it was a spoof of Wonder Woman about a costume superwoman who uses her super, uses her super great big boobs <laughs> to fight crime. Now, there was no nudity in it, no profanity, no real blood and guts. There was no, it was not an X-rated film in any way, shape, or form. But it was a campy, stupid, idiotic comedy. And I got Russ Meyer's famous big stars, Kitten Natividad, Haji, and Raven Delacroix to star in this movie. Now, these women had been famous in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. They had big, giant breasts, and they were doing these campy movies that Russ Meyer made. Russ Meyer was arguably one of the most famous, if not the most famous, independent filmmaker in America. He wrote, produced, directed, he shot his own movies, made millions was hugely successful, but that was his gimmick. Big, busty ladies that were over-the-top, camp comedy, larger-than-life movies, okay? And so I kind of took that formula, but did a spoof of Wonder Woman. And I got three of his famous stars to come back. Kitten Natividad was in Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. Haji was in Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Faster Pussycat Kill Kill is one of the most famous cult films ever, and uh, Raven Delacroix, who was in Russ Meyer's Up, which was another crazy film. And so we made this movie. I had so much fun making The Double D Avenger. I loved making The Double D Avenger. I laughed through that whole thing. It was just so stupid. It was the most, it was like a Saturday Night Live sketch, but elongated to a film. Forrest J. Ackerman, uh, from Famous Monsters of Film Land was in it, and he played a wax museum caretaker in the Movie Land Wax Museum in the Chamber of Horrors. We shot, that was one of the locations. Fantastic location. They had a set of Boris Karloff as Frankenstein in the Frankenstein set. Then they had Bela Lugosi as Dracula in the Dracula set, and they had Lon Chaney Jr. as the werewolf in, in the werewolf set. That, the sets... If you'd never been to the Movie Land Wax Museum, it's no longer there, sadly. It was in Buena Park. It was the most magnificent place. Those wax figures were perfect. The sets were elaborate, like real movie sets. Beautiful lighting. So there's Forrest Ackerman, Mr. Monster Movie Sci-Fi himself, and then I've got the Russ Meyer stars there, and we're doing this crazy thing. It was absolutely fantastic. Now... When we drove down to the Movie Land Wax Museum, I'll tell you this one funny story. 
uh, Forrest Ackerman had a home that was like a museum for memorabilia. It was called the Acker Mansion. And so the kitten and Haji and I went in and uh, Forrest gave him a tour of the place, including his bedroom. And he had quite a number of photos in his bedroom displayed on the walls of ladies in their birthday suits. <laughs> And before anything beyond the bounds of respectability could happen, I quickly ushered Forey and Kitten uh, into the car to go to the Wax Museum because uh, we didn't have time for any sort of extracurricular activities up there. <laughs> but uh, knowing Kitten, but uh, I love Kitten. But anyway, um, the Double D Avenger uh, did very well on DVD and on VHS tape. And there was a second release here. Joe Bob Briggs, the famous uh, drive-in movie critic, he was the host of Monster Vision. Joe Bob Briggs did a version where he did a comical audio commentary, poking fun at me and the movie and the whole thing and the stars. And we licensed it to Europe. There's a French-language version of the Double D Avenger. We licensed it to Japan. There's a Japanese-language version of the Double D Avenger. This stupid Z-grade low-budget, idiotic comedy, which is just a happy pill. It's just a funny little farce. Did very well. And it still does very well. And I'm shocked at how well it does. And it goes on and on. And we license stuff. I just licensed the rights to a big toy company uh, to do action vinyl action figures of the Double D Avenger. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on and on. From that, I did a film, totally the opposite now, called Frankenstein vs. the Creature from Blood Cove. Now, that was a homage to the Universal Studios monster movies and creature features um, shot in black and white. I had a story idea of what would happen if the Frankenstein monster met sort of the creature from the Black Lagoon, and they had a battle under the waves in the ocean with the, you know, lightning going and thunder crashing and whatnot. And uh, from that idea, I, I wrote a story, wrote a, wrote a script. And from my acting money and from Double D Profits and such, I was able to finance another William Winkler production. And Frankenstein vs. the Creature had marvelous special effects makeup. And uh, Matthias Schubert, my cinematographer editor, did an incredible, incredible job. And we had little fun cameos. Raven Delacroix came back and played a gypsy woman. Butch Patrick from the Munsters uh, played a, a werewolf when he was transforming back into his human form after having been shot. I needed a sleazy drunk in this bar, this seaside bar. And uh, it was sort of like a... a bikini dancing bar in a way. And, and so I wound up having Ron Jeremy, the infamous Ron Jeremy, uh, appear in a cameo in the thing as well. <clears throat> David Gerald was also in it from Star Trek in as an office uh, writer, it, you know. And I played a, a big part, and I, it was a way, another way for me to exercise my acting uh, skills. I played a part in Double D Avengers, Chastity Knot's cousin, and then I played Bill Grant, this this cheesecake photographer who stumbled upon this mad scientist resurrecting these monsters, and we were trapped. We were held hostage in the story. And so, anyway, Frankenstein versus the Creature won Best Feature Film at the World Horror Convention, and it continues to sell to this day, and it did very well and overseas. And there were uh, model kits made of the creature and other stuff. So it was uh, soundtracks by Lakeshore Records, which was the biggest Hollywood soundtrack company. It was quite amazing. You know, whenever there's these big Hollywood movies with Brad Pitt or whatever, usually Lakeshore's the, the label that releases the soundtrack. And they loved Mel Lewis's music in Frankenstein vs. the Creature. So we had that going. But uh, those were some of the movies that I originally created, and then we went into even more anime after that. Toei Animation, Toei Animation, which was a huge company, came to me and wanted me to make um, compilation feature films in English of a lot of their properties. And so um, they'd been doing this for years. It was a Japanese idea to take 
successful television series and make compilation feature films out of them, usually comprised of four or five episodes or whatever that would link together and tell a story beginning, middle, and end. So we started with Guy King. Now, Guy King was about uh, this giant robot who would defend Earth from aliens attacking Earth. It was very unique because there was a spaceship called the Space Dragon. And at the front of the Space Dragon was this skull head of this dragon. The skull would separate from the dragon body when it had to be activated, and arms and legs would attach to it. And the skull part was the trunk or body of Guy King, and Guy King's head would come out of it. It was a very famous toy. Mattel Toys made Guy King die-cast toys, released them here in the United States, and also made a big, giant, two-foot-tall plastic toy of Guy King. Guy King was a famous, classic Japanese robot toy. I even had it when I was a kid, you know. And uh, so it was thrilling to make Guy King. We made three movies. I did the voice of Sanchiro, who was the pilot of Guy King, you know. And... Uh, those, those uh, movies were released in Japan, and they were also released here by Shout Factory. Released them on DVD. Then after, after Guy King, we did a property called Dan Gard Ace. Dan Gard Ace was about uh, Earth was running out of resources, so they were going to colonize other planets, and there was this spaceship that was going to go out. But protecting the spaceship was a transforming robot called Dan Gardais, and it would protect the ship and battle this villain uh, named uh, Doppler, I think his name was, I remember. And uh, anyway, uh, Dan Gardais was like a spaceship that would transform into a super robot. And uh, anyway, it had been a famous, like Guy King, it had been a famous uh, Mattel toy, a die-cast metal toy, and uh, they were sold all over America. And also, he was a comic book character. Marvel Comics had a comic book line called Shogun Warriors. And Dan Gard Ace was one of the starring characters that Marvel had licensed. So when you saw the comic book series, Stan Lee Presents the Shogun Warriors, Dan Gard Ace was like the star. I made three... Dan Gardais films based on that character, based on the original Japanese character. And I did some voices in that. I played Captain Dan, who was kind of a deeper voice, you know, and, and uh, he was masked, and uh, he was the father of the pilot of Dan Gardais. And then I also played a villain using a German accent. There was this guy who was sort of an Aryan-looking guy with blonde hair, you know, and he was a German accent. You know, my mother's German. So I can pick up accents. I've got a whole bunch of accents I do. But anyway, the German accent worked beautifully for the uh, for this kind of villainous character who also redeemed himself at the end before he was shot to death. <laughs> you know? Anyway, after that, we did a series called Starzinger. There were three shows. In America, it had been previously dubbed uh, and shown in syndication. It was called Space Cateers. Basically, you had three androids who were like the three musketeers and, you know, in space. In the original idea, it was sort of like Journey to the West. Journey to the West was a famous Chinese story about a monkey and a sea demon and a, and a pig character that would travel with escorting a princess or a prince. Anyway, in our show, you had these kind of androids with those characteristics of monkey, pig, and sea uh, demon. Uh, taking this cosmic princess on a journey. And uh, I remember I did the voice of Sir Jogo, who was sort of the sea demon character, android. But he was very nerdy. He was kind of a very, he had a calculator and everything. So he was very forward in the mouth. He kind of used this sort of a voice, you know. He was quite uh, interesting. Well, princess, I, I, I don't know exactly. It was that type of thing. Um, that was another really famous classic title. Then Toei came to me and said, we'd like you to do Fist of the North Star. <laughs> and I remember, that's the one that I thought was too over the top. But you see, by this time, 
Television had completely changed. We have 10 million channels. We have all the internet channels. We have the streaming and downloading, blah, 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 blah. So I wasn't in that straitjacket anymore that I was in when we did Tech A Man, you know, Peggy Sharon and Action for Children's Television and the Network Standards and Practice, all that stuff was kind of, wasn't gone, but it, it was not, I didn't have to worry about it, okay? Because these things would have been DVD and streaming and cable and whatever. So I left all the violence in, and we, these were authentic English dubs of Fist of the North Star. We did six of them, six feature films. And for that one, I did the voice of Kenshiro, but he was very much of kind of a Clint Eastwood. It was very down here. And he didn't talk much. It wasn't much talking. But then when he would fight, he would go way up and, you know, this type of thing. It was like Bruce Lee type. It was sort of like a cross between Bruce Lee and, and Road Warrior is what it was. I mean, obviously, that was, that, that's what the influence was for Fist of the North Star. So, anyway, um, we did six of those. And um, I started getting s certain celebrity friends of mine that I knew to do voices. And I remember Chase Masterson did some voices in that. And she was in uh, Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine and, and some of those Star Trek shows. Um, oh, and in Starzinger, I had Ann Lockhart do some voices in that. Uh, in Guy King, I had Robert Axelrod, who was the voice of Finster and Lord Zed in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I had different people doing voices and such. Um, but Fist of the North Star is a very famous, again, classic title. Before that, we did two films of Space Pirate Captain Harlock, another famous title. And uh, I remember... Uh, you know, it was. They went to a pi. They went to a, a cowboy planet in one of the movies. I remember it was like, it was weird. It was science fiction, but the pirate was on this planet with like cowboys and stuff. So I know Larry Butler, who did a lot of voices for me, went into his whole cowboy type of. You know, he was doing this sort of you know rough and tough cowboy character, and uh, but it was very interesting. I did Harlock, um, you know, it was, I would do voices that would fit my range. And, um, and Harlock was, it, it, again, it worked because our original Harlock show that we did, we did the original one with the evil alien Mazone. These were these sort of, sort of plant women. Um, he was very young looking. I mean, the guy looked like he was 20 years old. I mean, when you looked at his face, it was crazy, but he wasn't. But, I mean, it was a very young guy. Um, there was a lady, a, a wonderful actress, British actress in Frankenstein vs. the Creature, named Alison Lees Taylor, and I had her play the queen of the Mazone. And uh, all the Mazone women had British accents. And I thought that was an interesting touch, you know, that they were alien and they all had this British accent thing. And uh, I remember David Gerald played the part of the president, who was a complete idiot. I mean, the character of the president was a, you know, they were obviously making some sort of social commentary about, you know, bureaucracies. But anyway, um, so we did Space Pirate Captain Harlock. Again, I, these were like all the famous classic titles, you know. Following that, we did something called Kataro's Graveyard Gang. Now, that was one of my favorites. And Kitaro was a yokai monster. It was a Japanese legendary... Uh, there's all these Japanese legendary monsters called yokai, okay? Goblins, ghouls, whatever. And uh, Kitaro was sort of like a zombie boy, you know? And I played some ghoul and... Uh, I remember I used Jonathan Harris's voice. Jonathan Harris was a good friend of mine. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But um, he had this type of a voice, you see. He was quite an interesting character, you know. Um, I had Butch Patrick come in and do a voice of one of the ghouls. In... But you see, what's interesting about that one was I had a little more freedom with the script. And I could incorporate Adam's Family and Munster's type humor into this thing. 
It was like an Adams Family or Munsters anime. It was almost, I, I think it was the absolutely perfect. I think the English dubbing of that was just phenomenal. And I think that the jokes worked and it was, everybody who saw it or saw clips said, my God, that's the best one we've ever done. We did two of those films. And, um, you know, after that, I also did some girls anime shows. We did something called The Adventures of Nausea. And uh, for that one, it was very interesting. We, we started singing. In other words, Nadja sang songs in the anime episodes in, Eng in Japanese. We were given karaoke tracks, and I had to be a songwriter and suddenly write the English lyrics that would rhyme to these songs. And I remember one of the uh, authors of the songs, this girl said, Why are you... Your lyrics, Mr. Winkler, are a little different than our Japanese. I said, well, I have to make them rhyme. The ideas are the same. It's authentic and faithful to what you, authentic and faithful to what you wrote, but I have to make the lyrics rhyme. That's why the words are a little different. And then she says, well, why, why do American music lyrics have to rhyme? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, don't they in Japanese? And she said, no, not all the time. Anyway, so we, we did that. It turned out great, you know. Mel Lewis, who did the music in Frankenstein versus the Creature, also did certain music. There was something with Fist of the North Star where somehow we didn't have the instrumental music with instrumental melodies for the opening themes and ending themes of that. Or there was something with rights, or I can't remember. We had to create that again. So when you listen to it, it sounds, it's note for note, it is exactly the Fist of the North Star opening theme and ending theme, instrumental music with instrumental melodies. But we did it. We had to redo, we had to create the, the soundtracks. So then we began doing the music, and the music was great. For music and singing, we have a separate dubbing session for that, as if we're cutting a record, a record album. And uh, I remember the girl who did the voice of Nadja was fantastic and wonderful singer, too. We did something similar um, with Lun Lun the Flower Girl. That was another one we did. Now, that was one of the silliest things that, that I did. It was, she was looking for a magical flower and had a boyfriend who would show up and give her flower seeds to plant. And she had a talking dog and a cat. It was clearly a little girl's thing. And, uh, but I remember we had to redo the opening theme and ending theme for that, too. And we couldn't even use the original song. For some reason, Toei says, come up with something original, which we did. So we tried to do something similar in a similar vein, but we couldn't use the original opening and ending theme. The, the, the background music in the shows were the same. But, uh, and then I did pilots. I did pilots for Digimon, and I did pilots for uh, Pretty Cure 5. And those turned out great, you know. Pretty Cure 5 was sort of like a Power Rangers with girls. And um, and then the uh, Digimon is very famous. We did one called Digimon Fusion Battles. Uh, there's a story to that, and I'll just, I'll, I'll make it very quick. Um, I made some really, what I thought were fantastic pilots for Digimon, okay? Really great pilots. And the casting was... I, Larry Butler played this villain named Mad Leoman who was just, you know, he went... I mean, you know, he really fulfilled the part. The guy playing the leads, the kids were great. Um, I did the voice of a robot called Ballistamon or something, you know. And uh, the goal was we were to produce the series. William Winkler Productions made those pilots so that William... So we, so we did these pilots for Digimon, and they were successful with the test audiences and were played at trade shows. And then a little while later, they wound up on American television, but William Wick Productions was not dubbing them, as we had expected to do, because we made these sensational pilots. That's show business, right? So we just moved on to the next thing which was, uh, by the way, I will say that when I, I did, out of curiosity, I looked at the show that was not done by us. In fact, I saw some of the pilots that we dubbed, and then when it went to series, 
I thought it was the most abysmal <laughs> dubbing I'd ever heard. When Larry Butler played this mad Leomon character, remember, he fulfilled the part. Or, you know, he went crazy. And he made this grand entrance, I remember. And then I saw the scene of the final dub, and it was just so meek and mild and no energy. I thought, oh, my God, you know. So, again, that's show business, right? Occasionally you get the rug pulled out from under you. Uh, <clears throat> did many, many other shows after that. I mean, we, we did some things that were uh, uh, motion comics. This was a very interesting thing. They would take manga. Manga is Japanese for comic book. They would take comic books, and they would scan them in computers, and they would do pan and scan and, and cut out the backgrounds. They'd colorize it, and you could actually animate limited animation using comic book material as a source art. It was called motion comics. <clears throat> we recorded a whole bunch of those. I remember Kyoto Karasuma, Kyoto Karasuma or something. There was one of them. It was like, it was like an X-Files type thing. Some woman was a investigation investigator, FBI type thing, investigating weird stuff like like X-Files. Uh, there was another one called Otogi Suji, which was like, sort of like Kitaro, all sorts of demons and gods of Japan. There was another one uh, we did called Mystical Detective Loki, which I always thought was sort of a Harry Potter-ish type thing that we did. But I don't know, I think if you're going to do anime, I love anime, fully animated anime. And if you're going to do motion, if you're going to have manga, it should just be a book, I think. I don't know. I don't know how well motion comics, at the end of the day, worked. I guess there's an audience for them. Um, and I just, again, all this work just continues. You know, we've done so much more. Uh, lots of other anime. I, I, <clears throat> I did pilots for uh, Prepara, which is called Prism Paradise. Prism, not prison. That was singing again, right? <clears throat> Basically, the plot to that was girls get these magical tickets and get to go to this sort of American Idol, Willy Wonka type place. It's like a combination of Willy Wonka meets American Idol. And the girls sang. So I had wonderful voice actresses who came in. Again, I had to write the lyrics to the songs. <clears throat> and we recorded... The girls had to be excellent Hollywood act, voice actresses, but also professional pop singers. And every one of them did that. And uh, those pilots were, were great, you know. I am, I, I think out of all the work that I've done, I'm very, very proud of the Ultraman movies that I've made. Now remember, back in the late 80s, we were going to do, we were trying to do Ultraman 80 with Adam West. And so there'd been communication back and forth. And again, it's kind of like the work comes to me. I'm not pursuing it. But Subaraya came to me, knew about all the stuff I was doing, and said, we'd like you to, we're going to start turning our feature films into American English language versions. And I said, great. So... I, I did go to Japan. Uh, the Japanese government knows of my work and endorsed me and flew me first class airline and hotel meals. I had a translator and uh, I met with different clients and different people in Japan. And uh, Subaraya, the, the head guy there at the time, uh, Jun Yokoyama, Yokoyama-san uh, took me to dinner and said, basically, I, I, I we'd like to I would like to have you, do, have you do some dubbing for us. I said, great, okay. So we started with Ultraman Ginga S, the movie, and we made a fantastic English dub of that feature film. It was based on the television series. And then after that, they, they loved the quality of it. And I think what I was able to do is over all these years take all the skills and all the abilities that I had of dubbing and it was like one big rehearsal for Ultraman. And those dubs I'm really 
proud of because I think it the illusion I tried to create was that these were American Japanese American actors living and working in Hollywood speaking their Native American tongue of American English that's what I was trying to do American children English speaking children all over the world will not watch subtitled content period okay Subtitled films are watched by certain teenage fan groups or certain art house film groups, but mainstream American audiences, especially audiences of children, the, the American, the, the key demographic group for Ultraman, okay, especially boys ages 6, 7, 8, 9, they're not going to watch subtitled content. They never will. They never have. It's impossible. It has to be dubbed. So my goal was to create near-perfect dubs that lip-sync perfect, emotional performances perfect. Remember what I told you about Don Richardson? Acting's 80% emotion. The emotions have to match those characters precisely, and that's what I tried to do with Ultraman Ginga as the movie. Sue Briar loved it. And then immediately he got another film called Ultra Fight Victory, which was a TV film, kind of a sequel to Ginga. And we did that, and I had some great voices in that, let me tell you. Um, again, fantastic voice, and we, we had voice actor continuity. So the voice actor for Hikaru, and the voice actor for Sho, and the voice actress for Sakuya, uh, those, peop- those Hollywood actors came back and did it again. And uh, so we'd have this marvelous uh, sound for the American audience. Then... They gave me Ultraman X, the movie. Now, Ultraman X, the movie, is very special because it is the 50th anniversary film of Ultraman. Now, how fantastic is that? I mean, remember, as a kid, I'd be watching Ultraman Monday through Friday, do my homework, watch it. I loved it. And now I'm making the American English version that the entire English-speaking world will see probably into perpetuity. I mean, the, Subrai owns these, these versions uh, of the 50th anniversary film of Ultraman. I'm so proud and honored to be part of that. And again, that, I think that was our, I mean, I, that was, I think that was my masterpiece as far as dubbing. I think that was a near-perfect movie. I'm so proud of the voice actors and the script and everything. It, they, they were great. And we even had uh, in January of 2017, we had a limited theatrical release of Ultraman Ginga S. the movie and Ultraman X. the movie as a double feature. And we were in about 40 cities across the United States and Canada, Chicago, I mean, Chicago and L.A. and New York and Dallas and, and, and Toronto and Vancouver and, I mean, 40 different cities the movies played in the theaters. The audiences loved the films. The reaction was a hundred percent positive, and the 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 all the internet buzz was oh my god these are fantastic you got to go see them these are great blah blah blah. Uh, in Chicago, the Chicago Music Box Theater, the audiences went crazy, and the buzz and Twitter and all that was phenomenal. Nostalgic parents took their kids to see it so it was the audiences were full of kids and nostalgic adults and teenagers and it just proved the work that we did was was excellent you know then we got more ultraman and uh we did the this is another thing i'm very proud of we did the one and only warner brothers ultraman film warner brothers japan was involved in a film called Mega Monster Battle Ultra Galaxy. This was a big budget movie, lots of characters. So I'm credited on this Warner Brothers picture. I mean that how again, how fantastic is that? Again, and 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 the the quality of that film is just as good as X in my Ultraman X the movie. Again, it was the casting worked, the voice actors worked. It was just Phenomenal. And then after that, we did another feature film for Ultraman. It was a sequel to Mega Monster Battle called Ultraman Zero, The Revenge of Belial. And that one had a great story. 
Anissa Vong is an actress I use to play kid voices. And she, again, did it again. When you listen to her and you see it, see the kid actors acting, you think it's a kid talking. I mean, it's the most uncanny thing. She's a, she's a young woman in her 20s, uh, uh, and, and it just boggles my mind every time. It's magical when, he, when she does the role. And again, another fantastic cast. And then we just, uh, we did another film after that called Ultraman Saga, which was another big film, lots of dialogue heavy stuff. A, an actor named, a uh, voice actor named Paul Stanko does the voice of Ultraman Cosmos. Again, voice actor continuity. Uh, the same actor who was uh, Cosmos in previous pictures came back and was Cosmos in Saga. The voice actor who played Ultraman Zero, Daniel Van Thomas, came back and he was Zero in all the pictures. So there's beautiful voice actor continuity in these movies. And Saga was famous because there's a well-known Japanese musical group called AKB48. And these girls were in, starring in, the uh, Ultraman Saga movie. I even had some voice actresses come in from New York to do the voices of the AKB. When we did Ultraman X the movie, uh, I was focused on the writing and directing, and my editor said to, I, I said to my editor, well, who are we gonna cast for Ultraman X, the voice of Ultraman X? And he says, Bill, you sound like the Japanese actor who does Ultraman X. And I said, I do. And she says, yeah, you have what? So we tried it, we were in the studio, and I tried some of the lines, and then I played it back. I said, you know, you're right. I do sound like him, sort of, don't I? <laughs> so anyway, I played the voice of Ultraman X. And it was sort of, the way, he, the way I played him, it was sort of a little bit of a Gary Owens type of voice, you know, kind of a very serious type of uh, classic hero, you know. Ultraman is a... Kind of like a classic DC Comics 1950s-ish type voice, or at least that's that's how he was. And I saw X that way in some of the lines he was reading and his relationship with Daichi and all of that. Uh, that was the interpretation that, that we did, and I think it worked great, you know. And the guy who played Daichi, too, Britton Simons, was phenomenal. His, the Ultraman property and the Ultraman brand is very, very famous in Japan. They have an Ultraman day in Japan. It is iconic. It is bigger than Star Wars in Japan and in many parts of Asia. Um, Eiji Tsuburaya, I think, was a genius. And honestly, he really co-created Godzilla and Rodan and Mothra and King Ghidra, all those giant Japanese monsters, okay? He was a special effects photographer and and, and and effects man, and he had an idea for a superhero character, and Ultraman was the superhero character. It's basically what would happen if you needed a superhero to fight Godzilla. You need a big, tall guy to do it, and Ultraman is it. And uh, so the original show was in 1966. And they've done many series and many movies afterwards, and the merchandising is huge, and it predates the Power Rangers, and uh, and it, it, it's it's I'm so thrilled and honored to be part of that Ultraman universe. I think it's some of the best stuff I've done. Actually, one of the first Japanese uh, live-action films that I English dubbed was a Japanese zombie movie, horror movie called Zombrex Dead Rising Sun for Capcom and Kiji Inafune, the guy who created Mega Man. And that was a very interesting film. It was sort of a 1980s slasher, zombie, gory movie, and we English dubbed that one. Uh, a couple other anime things that happened were uh, we did an episode of Free Eternal Summer. Free is a, about a high school swim team. And they had an episode where they went to Australia, and they actually recorded Australian voices. So Winkler Productions, we were hired to do the episode for all the English dialogue, and <clears throat> I did one of the voices of the Australians. But we had real Australian people living and working in Hollywood doing voices for that. And we sent the tracks to Japan. I was working with storyboards. So we, there was no anime that was dubbed. I mean, it was all storyboards that we were working to. And then they animated it afterwards, you know. 
We also did a movie, a great kids film called Eden. It was sort of like a Madagascar type of film that for production read. I did a lot of work with production read. Uh, I did some distribution. I'm not usually a distributor, but I did some distribution for Minky Momo, which was their famous series. And uh, Eden was uh, just a very wonderful children's animated film, kind of a Disney-ish type of movie with an environmental theme. Well, the way it works when I cast is I will listen to professional demo reels that the actors have done, and then we have audition sessions, and then I have, and then I test them out a little bit and see if they follow direction and whatnot. I also have a group of about 30 voice actors I work with on a semi-regular ba regular basis, really. And so I always try to, I know what voices fit where. I know what my people can do. And I, because, you know, I don't want to have to train somebody about dubbing, you know. I'd rather just use the people I know that know the pauses and all the little Winkler Productions tricks that we do and how I write my scripts. And I write all the scripts. I don't have other writers. I'm not a factory turning out thousands of hours of content every week, okay, like some companies are, do that. I don't. I personally will write and produce and direct all the material. And um, usually feature films. Usually feature films. Um, and so, although we've done series before, and we can easily do series, but um, in a nutshell, that's how we do the casting. There's a difference between anime and live action. When you're dubbing for live action, it's infinitely more complicated and detailed, okay? Because that really has to be perfect. With anime, it's the same type of attention to detail, but you're dealing with a flap that's going up and down generally. And so while we still give it 110%, it's easier to dub to anime than it is to live action. But um, it's all in the scripts. It's my dubbing scripts, okay? That's the foundation upon which everything is built. If that script has problems, forget it. You're in, you've got nightmares. When we subtitle a film, it's a literal translation of the Japanese, okay? I have a wonderful translator, Emily Midori Nelson, and she translates the scripts. And those are the scripts that we use for the subtitles. Those are the ones that the fan groups and people who like to watch their stuff subtitled will see, and it's exact, it's authentic to what the Japanese characters are saying, okay? Now, for the rest of the world, for the other 330 million Americans, and for every single kid in the audience, they will watch my dubbed versions. My dubbed versions are authentic and faithful to what the Japanese have created. We never edit the picture. We never physically cut stuff out of the movies at all. It's all uncut, unedited. Um, but I do have to rewrite the scripts for the dubbing purposes to match the lip syncs and the vowels and the consonants and all the funny things that they do. And I've add all the laughter and the coughing and the panting. And if somebody's running, how many times did they pant? What was the laughter? Was it six, seven ha-has? What was it? You know, there's anything that comes out of the mouth, whether it's word, it doesn't have to be words. It can be a cough, it sneeze, whatever. The voice actor has to do in the booth. And so my scripts, again, if you see them, they're so detailed, and the pauses are there, and the directions for teeth or movements or cough or pant or whatever, everything is written down. And so when the actors get into the dubbing booth, everything's there. And there we record everything. And then in the post-production, we tweak it even more, and you have what is essentially a perfect performance, you know. I have to, I always get the emotions out of the actors. You know, who are you? What do you want? Okay, what does he want in the scene? How does he feel? Look at the expression. Look at how he's, how he's reacting. He's all crazy. Or she's sad. She's tragic. More sadness. More. A lot of times it's, there's a lot of over-the-top acting when they're in the superhero modes. You know, and I got to really get, bring up the energy for, for people. 
Uh, some actors I have to always keep, I have to bring them down. You know, in dialogue scenes, what takes maybe four sentences in Japanese, we can do it in one sentence in English. Which, which means I then have to use some artistic creative license and create some dialogue that aids the plot, keeps the plot moving, and stays stays in continuity of what the character is saying and thinking. So it's really a lot of, there is a, I mean, it, it is, it's creative writing. It's creative writing. You are staying faithful to those characters and how they would think and how they would, the dialogue they would use, the words that they would use. But you're creating all new stuff in those rare circumstances where I have to fill space. Because in Japanese, it was short, and in English, it, or vice versa, and there's extra flaps I have to fill. You know, at, movement, mouth movements. Humor is another thing. It's very strange. Comedy and humor does not always translate well. People will laugh at jokes that are not, when you translate them, they're not funny. So then you can inject a little American humor into it. Again, staying in line with what the plot is, what the story is, but you make it a little bit funnier, a little bit uh, more, uh, you give it more of an American sense of humor, and it makes the comedy work. And that's when, when all the characters are laughing, you got a typical ha-ha ending of, of a show or film or whatever. It's genuinely funny because I wrote something that was funny, where the translation's not funny. To, to an audience, because something goes wrong in the translation. When I cast these voices, it's like trying to fit a key in a lock. you got to get the right sound. And you say to yourself, do I believe that that voice is coming out of that face? Then the emotion has to match the Japanese actor exactly. Our American actors have to sort of channel... I mean, I don't want to go into woo-woo stuff or anything, but they have to kind of channel those actors and really be and feel those emotions that those Japanese actors are feeling and to think the thoughts of what those Japanese actors are thinking. And that's how you get a fantastic performance. There's all sorts of other tricks to dubbing, okay? Speeding up, slowing down, uh, taking pauses... Uh, the way I write my English dubbing scripts is a certain method I use where there's certain instructions and cues the actors know ahead of time. Oh, I have to do this with my mouth or teeth. You know, I can't, <laughs> you know, uh, certain laughter. Ha, ha, ha would be H-A-H-A-H-A. <laughs> you know, H-E-H-H-E-H, you know, all sorts of There's certain things like, mm, that's a Japanese cultural thing. Yes, yes, but it's a, mm, but the intention is, mm. Many times when they fight, they'll cry out or they'll they'll announce the weapon they're going to use, you know. And it's always a... It's always going up, you know, like... Uh, Xanadium beam! You know, that type of thing. It's... Bah, 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 bah. You know, there's all these little things. Proximity when you're dubbing. If, if I'm talking to somebody that's three blocks away... I'm going to scream it out to them three blocks away. But if you're right next to me, did you see that guy over there? What's he doing? I mean, the proximity of the person you're talking to changes. So many things. Another funny bit that I did was I played a, a soldier in an episode of China Beach and the girls in that television series. It was a, kind of a famous series, China Beach. And... Uh, the girls were putting on a fashion show in this episode, and the director said to us, you guys are all horny soldiers, and go crazy for these girls doing the fashion shows and everything else. And she t he told me to grab Dana Delaney, who was the star and sexy girl at the time, to grab Dana's beautiful behind, which I did. And I loved, as you would come by, I'd grab her butt, so the entire, and he loved, he said, do more, do more. He really loved what I was doing. So anyway, I got to, I got paid to spend an afternoon grabbing Dana Delaney's gorgeous derriere. <laughs> 
One of the most bizarre series that I ever worked on, and I mean, people cannot believe it to this day that I did this. I wrote, produced, and directed, co-directed, a comedy variety television series that aired in Los Angeles for 13 weeks called Short Ribs that starred famous little actor Billy Barty <laughs> and Patty Maloney and Jimmy Briscoe. It was like Saturday Night Live with an entire cast of little people, midgets and dwarves, uh, Billy Barty was the executive producer and, I guess, creator of the show. I was the main writer and, and, and producer on the show. But to be honest with you, I wound up writing most of the shows. <clears throat> and it was like, again, like Saturday Night Live with little people. But it was unbelievable. It was just the most disastrous thing we were we were a year before in living color but instead of african-american cast it was all little people and i found billy barty to be so hard to work with so difficult to work with and uh you know my scripts would be rewritten so the comedy you know the in comedy you have a you have the setup and then the punchline. either the setup was fouled up or the punchline was fouled up. And sometimes Barty used cue cards instead of memorizing the lines. So, you know, Robin Williams was great at improvisation, but I didn't believe that Billy Barty was a Robin Williams in improvisation. And so the show has this most incredible nightmarish quality to it. It was, it, it's the most bizarre thing you'd ever seen. There'd be spoofs of television shows and commercials it was sponsored by 7-Up, and 7-Up sponsored the show. And it aired uh, primetime Saturday nights, 8.30 to 9 here in L.A., and then later it was syndicated. But it was, you got to see it to believe it, you know. Um, it, it was just, it was, an, it, was, it was an absolute disaster, really. But now let me tell you the funny thing. I'd been owed a little bit of money at the time, and I was very young at that. It was one of the early shows that I did, and Barty didn't pay me. So I kept trying to get him to pay me. He wouldn't pay me, and then, sadly, I had to take him to, of all places, small claims court. <laughs> now, the AP wire services picked up on this. Little Billy Barty and small claims court, small Billy Barty, small Billy There was so much press and publicity, and PR. We were on Entertainment Tonight. We were in every newspaper in the country. It, they had a field day with this story. Of course, I won the case, and I got my money. But it was the most publicity Billy Barty had ever had in his entire career. And, uh, you know, it was all negative, actually. But it was just, uh, it was such a lost opportunity because something that crazy could have worked and could have been hugely... Again, we were a year before in, in Living Color, and it, nothing like it had ever been done. There'd be spoofs of TV shows and commercials, and, you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies would be spoofed as the Beverly Hillbilly Barties, you know, and, and there'd be all sorts of child safety products that went wrong, but the little people would be posing as, now, if this is your child wearing the seat and whatever, and... It was, it, it had a, I tried to create sort of a Monty Python, British humor type of show that was just off the wall and outrageous. And Barty seemed to kind of want to do more of a Lawrence Welk type of show. And it, we clashed, you know. And, you know, after the show got canceled, my father had died of cancer. And it was a rare, very rough time for me. And what he did with that whole situation and the lawsuit and everything else was just really despicable, you know. He's, he's the weirdest story, true story. When Barty passed away, I didn't know he'd passed away, but I, I swear this is truth. I woke up having had a nightmare, and the nightmare was there was a little screaming demon in a hot rod screaming down the hill, and it was on fire. And then, I swear to God, I woke up, and it was like a scary nightmare. I thought, what the hell is that? And I thought, was that Barty or something? 
The next morning on the news, I found out that Barty died. And that's a true story. So is that crazy? I was great friends with Jonathan Harris, who played the part, starred as Dr. Smith in the classic Lost in Space television series. Jonathan Harris was sort of like an uncle to me. We used to get together for lunch all the time at the Hamburger Hamlet, and we would meet maybe twice a month or so for like 12 years. And we laughed. He told me all his stories. Uh, he taught me a lot about the business of show business. He taught me about old Hollywood. Talk, we talked a lot about acting and what he did as an actor and how he played all the characters he played, how he played Dr. Smith, what he was doing, what was going on in his head when he was playing Smith and when he was playing Mr. Phillips uh, in, in, in uh, uh, the Bill Dana show and when he was playing Bradford Webster in The Third Man and even Lucifer in Battlestar Galactica, you know. My acting teacher at UCLA, Don Richardson, as a coincidence, had directed a tremendous number of Lost in Space episodes. And he loved Jonathan Harris, and Jonathan loved Don. So we used to talk about Don. And I, I talked to Jonathan about how what Don taught me and everything. We laughed our heads off. He'd call me up. I'd pick up the phone. Hello? He'd say, Willy Winky? Yes? Shall we have lunch tomorrow at the Hamburger Hamlet? Yes, we will, Jonathan. Very good. I'll see you there at 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock. Sharp. Boom. You know, the stories he told me, I remember he'd, he said to me once, You know, Bill, if I hadn't starred and lost in space, I never would have watched it. <laughs> never would have watched it, Bill. I said, you know, science fiction wasn't his thing, really. I mean, he loved that show, and he loved that character. But, you know, sci-fi wasn't... I mean, he was into opera and, 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 you know, his own thing. You know, it wasn't, wasn't that. Remember, he said, Erwin Allen, Erwin had no taste, Bill. He had no taste, you know. People used to say, oh, Jonathan Harris, was, was he gay or did he try to do anything? Never pulled any fast ones with me. And let me tell you, he told me some stories about Love American style when he played a bank teller who had to get on his knees and read an account number that was tattooed on a woman's belly. You know, and he says, Willie, I was close enough to lick her blank, 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 you know. So I don't, I don't buy the, you know, some of the rumors about Jonathan. And another thing, I remember, I, we were talking about auditioning one time, and he said to me, he said, Willie, when you're auditioning, do it loud and strong. <laughs> Regardless of what it is. We were talking about acting one time, and he says to me, Willie, you know what acting is? <laughs> I said, no, what's acting? I mean, I knew, but I said, what? He says, acting is like having to show your cock to strangers. <laughs> and some other acting advice he gave me. Willie, directors don't direct actors, they direct traffic. The actor auditions for the rest of his life. Sometimes his last film is his audition. Nobody cares more about you than you. Our lives depend on whether the telephone rings or not. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you get a check, it's all bullshit. <laughs> Problems in your personal life must not affect the work. You are the character. Women are different from men chemically. Watch out. <laughs> Do not marry an actress. I've had to fight everyone I've worked for to get paid. They all want freebies. They interpret nice as weakness. There's no such thing as the black ball anymore. The saying has changed to, you'll never work in this town again until we need you. The best advice is to keep your eyes open, your ears open, and your mouth shut. He said, Willie, I paint with language. <laughs> he said, 
Willie, when you're hired to act in a piece of shit, you must think of it as wonderful material that you love doing. <laughs>